Track 1. Hi, James. How's your alternative energy research project going? To be honest, I'm a bit confused about how to do the research for all the different energy types. Well, the first thing you do is to make sure you focus your question, otherwise you'll have too much to read and you won't be able to select the key arguments. So how do I do that? Start with the general topic of alternative energy and then keep asking questions until you've narrowed the topic down to one particular area. Then, when you have your question, make a list of the reading you will need. This list should be general to give you some background, but remember you'll need to focus on the issues related to the question, so the reading list should also be specific to the actual energy source you've chosen, whether it's wind or solar or wave power. And then start reading? Absolutely. You need to start straight away, but don't forget to make notes as you read. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep track of ideas for future reference purposes. Yes, that makes sense. I think that's my main problem. I don't recall where I've read different ideas, so I can't find them again later. And my friends have warned me that not recording ideas in a system can really hinder your progress. Your friends are right. It's a common problem amongst students. You need a system. Anyway, once you've done the reading and made all your notes, you need to organise them so that you can analyse and think about what you've read. But I prefer to just start writing and then go back and look at my notes later. Hmm, I wouldn't recommend it. I think you need to give yourself more time to digest the material and arrange it into some kind of system ready for analysis in terms of relevance to your research question. Well, that's a great help. Thank you, Professor Jenkins. You're welcome. Come and see me again if you have any more problems. Track 2 Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, John. How is your essay going? Not so good, actually. Would you be able to help me with it? Of course. What do you want to know? Well, just the type of information you're going to write about. I won't copy you. I just want some ideas to get me started. Well, Mr Jones advised us to focus on just two or three forms of non-traditional energy for our evaluation. So, I think I'm going to choose solar. It's fairly easy to evaluate. Are you going to explain both the positive and negative aspects? Well, Mr Jones warned us not to get too involved in the ethical aspects of the topic, so I'm going to structure my essay by using the advantages and disadvantages of each energy form. That's why I also want to talk about biofuels. I think there are more disadvantages. Oh, I see what you're doing. Using the negative points of one to highlight the positive points of the other. That's a smart idea. And what about the third energy source? Hmm, I was having difficulty choosing between nuclear and wind because they're both problematic, but I've decided to do nuclear for my presentation instead. Thanks, Mary. Chatting to you has helped me think a bit more clearly about my essay. That's fine. Good luck with it. Track 3 Hi there, guys. Nice to see you. And you. So... Are we going to finalise what we're doing for the environmental science presentation today? I hope so. The presentation is next week. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about this, because I think we need to take out some of the information we're including. Oh, really? Like what, Shirley? Well, I'd like to suggest taking out the background details. I think it's just too much information to fit into ten minutes. But isn't it important to make sure the audience understands the context? I don't think so. And, and anyway, we could include the background details on the handout. OK, I'm with you on that. Chris, what do you think? Yes, OK, that's fine. I'll add the details to the handout. Anything else? Yes. I'm not sure whether the solar energy statistics will be too much for the audience to take in. There's a lot of numbers and graphs. Can we put the statistics on a handout too? Hmm, I see your point. We don't want people looking at lots of numbers while we're speaking. But without the statistics, I don't see how we can support our main ideas. Actually, you're right, Tom. I hadn't thought about that. In that case, can we delete the diagrams? It's going to take too much time to explain them. Hmm, let's think about that a bit more. If we have to choose between taking out the statistics or the diagrams, I think we should opt for the diagrams. 
they're less crucial to the presentation. What do you both think? I think it's going to work much better than the original plan we had. Absolutely. We won't have to worry about talking for longer than 15 minutes if we remove the diagrams and focus on the main ideas and statistics. Shall we all meet again tomorrow to finalise the details? Track 4 Hi everyone. Sorry I'm late. Don't worry, Hannah. We've only just started. We thought we should go over the theories we've studied so far, so we're ready for the seminar discussion on Thursday afternoon. Of course you're right. I don't think I can remember all the theories related to consumer energy consumption. No, Hannah. That's the reading for Friday's lecture. Thursday's seminar discussion is about the current thinking on alternative energy. Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm a bit disorganised at the moment. Never mind. So, Mike, what do you think about the academics' point of view on nuclear energy? Well, I think I have to agree with them on price being a factor for choosing nuclear in the long term. Me too. It's definitely the most cost-effective measure. Don't you agree, Hannah? To start with, I didn't, but the text Professor Edwards gave us persuaded me. The only thing that concerns me is that there have been some disasters in various parts of the world. Yes, some texts warn of the dangers of nuclear power, using previous disasters as examples. I know what you mean, but I suppose the risk is minimal these days. What do you think about wind and solar energy in terms of the price in relation to the advantages? For me, they're just not worth it. Both are expensive, and it's difficult to predict the amount of energy each one will produce. You know, Mike, I'm afraid I don't share your opinion. This text here talks about the likelihood of improved technology, increasing the amount of energy, and reducing the costs in the future. Yes, but that's not enough proof to be sure of the relationship between the costs and the benefits. Exactly. The evidence seems incomplete to me. Well, that's something we can follow up on with the rest of the group in the seminar on Thursday. Track 5 Good morning, Phil. Jackie, I hope your project is going well. Good morning, Mr Jackson. Hi, Mr Jackson. Well, we've made a start on analysing the different forms of renewable energy, but unfortunately, we don't really agree on some points. OK, why don't we talk about it? Well, Jackie believes that all forms of renewable energy are beneficial economically, whereas I doubt that that's true for all of them. Such as? Such as wind, wave and solar energy, because they're less reliable. That's a valid point, but I don't think that's a large enough factor to disregard it completely. Exactly. That's what I said. However, another drawback is that they're generally very expensive to produce. Yes, you're right. And that is a concern when evaluating their usefulness in future. I agree with you to a point, but it's likely that the cost will come down. I read a report in the Journal of Environmental Science that estimates the cost would fall by 20% over the next 10 years, which is significant, isn't it? Absolutely, Jackie. But you need to think about how difficult it is to predict the future cost of non-traditional energy sources before you believe the report. Remember, in your project, I want to see evidence of critical analysis. Make sure you've analysed all the information, rather than just accepting the information that you agree with. Also, it's very important that you demonstrate wide reading around the subject. I know. It's just that I'm not convinced that it's going to continue to be that expensive, especially if there's a demand from consumers. Well, what about if we analyse the costing process as part of our project? That's an excellent idea, Phil. OK, so let's imagine that we want to forecast the cost of producing solar energy. How could we do that, Jackie? Mm, well, I think we'd have to start by working out how many hours of daylight there are in the UK per year. The Meteorological Office would have data on that. Then estimate the number of hours of sun to get a rough total. And then I suppose we'd need to work out how much it would cost to supply the average home with solar power and then extrapolate that to get a number for the whole country. Good. And don't forget the price of power conversion stations. This will have a significant impact on overall expenditure. And there's one more factor you haven't taken into account yet regarding the consumers. Um, whether they would change from traditional to renewable energy? No, but 
Think about what might make them change. Oh yes, how much they would be willing to pay. Exactly. Well done. Track six. So our project is going to cover three main areas. Firstly, comparing the main forms of alternative energy: solar, wind, wave, and biofuels in terms of production costs. Secondly, we'll take solar energy as an example and do a cost prediction. And lastly, we'll analyze whether they're likely to replace traditional fossil fuels in the future. That sounds like a comprehensive project with a good focus. Now, what data are you going to use, and what approach will you use for the analysis? Ah, now that's something we do agree on. We want to use the reports you gave us in our last lecture and some statistics from the government, environment, and energy department. In terms of analysis, we're going to use a cross-referencing method where we compare each of the government reports with the Robertson report and highlight any differences. Then we'll analyze these to see why the differences exist and where more research needs to be done. Track seven. Okay, so to finish, I want to look at the resources available for researching UK census information for the essay you'll be writing at the end of this module. There are many resources for the study of the civilian population and family history out there, ranging from public to academic to commercial. Some are available for the public to access free of charge, whilst others are only available by payment of fees or restricted to academics and subject to registration. Some are more appropriate to family or genealogical investigation; others to historical population research. So, if we start at the beginning of the list on your handout, you'll see firstly. There is the Family Records Centre based in Central London. The centre and their website are available to anyone in the country who has an interest in researching demographic data. Their work might be useful to give you an overview of the general sorts of data and services available. Unfortunately, you do have to pay a registration charge of twenty pounds for a year's access to their material. The next resource on the list is Genes Reunited, which is mainly for people who want to find out more about their ancestors. There are some good interactive tools on this website, especially the one which shows you how to manipulate the National Census Association's statistical data. Although Genes Reunited is very useful, it is used by a range of businesses, and therefore accessing the site will cost you. Now, the third item on the handout is the National Census Association, which contains the most up-to-date data as it's compiled from official government census data every ten years. Both companies and individuals are able to access all their resources without payment, so this may be a good place to start your research. Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to two journals at the bottom of the handout. The first one. Journal of Historical Migration is not actually a journal, but a collection of articles on a website. Anyway, you might like to take a look at it because it has several articles on the importance of recording census data from a historical research perspective. This site is available to the general public, so you don't have to pay or register. The other one, the Journal of Social Demography, is only available using your university online journal's login details, as it can only be accessed by those studying or researching in higher education. Right. Well, that should be enough reading for you. Track eight. Today, I'd like to continue from last week's lecture. By looking at what helps people successfully integrate into a new culture, whereas the reasons for migration are nowadays fairly easy to identify and largely related to employment opportunities or political instability, the factors behind being able to adapt to the new culture and create a new life are considerably more complex. Let's start with an overview of the issues as shown on this diagram. Starting on the left of the diagram. 
there are two lists of factors, internal and external. It's important to notice that the internal factors, in other words, those based on an individual's personality, are divided into positive factors, trusting others and acknowledging that people are different, and negative, being afraid and being suspicious of people. You might think that the list of negative factors would include discrimination, but it doesn't because discrimination comes under the larger category of fear. Now, what you should also notice is that the external factors are not labelled in this way. It's much more difficult to know how to measure the effects of external factors and whether they actually are external or not. The influence of family relationships, climate, beliefs and values, and the ability to communicate in the language of the new culture have wide-ranging effects which are difficult to measure and can distort any research. Now focus on the centre of the diagram and you'll see this phrase, coping strategies. This is important because studies have shown that people who integrate well into a new culture, and that is any culture by the way, are those who have eradicated any negativity and made positive choices and adopted coping strategies such as observing people and taking time to listen and ask questions in order to diminish the effects of culture shock. What we have observed is that people who demonstrate positive coping strategies such as observing, listening and questioning end up by understanding the host culture better and integrating quicker and more successfully. However, those who choose to be critical of the differences and therefore react negatively to the host culture are likely to have increased feelings of alienation. This alienation can tail off and become the beginning of acceptance if a person has some positive experiences, but it usually deteriorates quickly into isolation.